Hey y'all, welcome back to The Inner. Today I'm joined by my sister, Marie Kovaly. Hi Marie. Hello, hello. I'm so happy you pronounced my last name right. That's awesome. Great start. <laughs> Thanks Nelson for having me. <laughs> Glad to have you on. If you could introduce yourself to the audience, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Okay, so my name is Marie Coverley. I'm known as Sacred Missions and Expeditions, but I'm also very much about those sacred missions and expeditions, taking people to spiritual sites, uh, very much about the ancient wisdom and modern day living to do with the Egypt teachings, the gods, the goddesses, but it's also about Avalon as well. And I mean, we're all different streams of consciousness. We're multidimensional. So anything I think the best way to describe me is an alchemical decoder. So taking all the really good ancient teachings and scripture, which can get very complex, running it through the Marie filter, hence why I call it the Gospel of Marie, and delivering it in my simpleton world and hoping it lands and having people work, you know, live and be able to apply it. So that's the sacred missions and expeditions is, is like a conversation as a sacred mission and expedition. And then, of course, it is the obvious, me taking my groups to Egypt, which I do every year, and of course, Avalon as well, and anywhere else which have got cool portals and pyramids really so yeah happy to be here thank you for having me that's awesome man yeah like i told you this behind the scenes but i'll say it in front of the camera too i enjoy your youtube videos just because well we're talking to the same divinity <laughs> yeah exactly uh, you were talking about segment the same time i was talking about segment um matter of fact i think it was the day i might have reached out to you you had uploaded a video on the ISIS codes and I uploaded one on the segment codes. Oh, really? So we were just infinity symbol the whole way, right? Yeah. <laughs> I love it. I really love it, you know? And that's what it's all about, that synchronicity, right? Yeah. So how did your spiritual journey kind of develop? Like, did you start freed? Were you once a part of, let's just say, Orthodox Christianity or Islam or anything and then develop? How did that really break down to become who you are and what you do now? Well, I think like that's a big thing, isn't it? I always find the big players, the masters are the ones that are born into like, you know, the, the very, very intense Christian or Catholic households. For me, I was just born into drug addiction. <laughs> that's That was my, I suppose it's the same thing, really, being locked in a prison one way or another. Um, but yeah. no, my background is, is like, you know, I came from a very loving family, you know, and I just, I remember as young as eight years old, just feeling super lonely. And I mean, like I come from, I'm from England, live in Africa. And, you know, big city families, like, are big. There's, like, city families, small town families, small. But, like, I came from uh, Birmingham, Wolverhampton. And, of course, the family vibes got loads of cousins, loads of aunties. And here's little old Marie, just so lonely and so isolated. And then I kind of got to, like, 12, 13 years old, and I had this this steely determination to be that wild child. And I started smoking cigarettes and I was just on self-destruct. I wanted to just go for the biggest party, the, the longest party. And then by the time I got to 16, I was reaching, man. Like all my friends were like wanting to go off and do their careers. I was like, the 90s rave scene was boosting in England. And I was like, I am gonna go and party on farmer's land illegally. And I'm gonna be part of the, the One Love movement. And that's exactly what I did. Um, and I think it was just like a revolution within in, inside of me trying to just be part of something because I never felt like I belonged. So, of course, like anything, you know, those 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 stories, they, they're only kind of fun and amazing for a short amount of time. And then the party gets very dark and everybody else goes home. And Marie was always the last one on the dance floor. And then that shifted into a very deep shade. And, you know, of course, then it's just a, a tumble down, just getting more and more lost and just seeking in the depths to just find family. And all you do is actually find more broken springs like you. And there's a, a kind of like dysfunctional comfort in that. But then it just gets to the point where your just soul is shattering and breaking. And that's kind of what happened from my years of about 12 years old to about 23, 20, 23 years old. You know, I was like on that mission as a star seed to break myself into pieces and I did it successfully. So two thumbs up. <laughs> so that was my entry. That was my that was my one of the uh, halls of Amenti layers, let's say, that I dived into. And that was intense because, of course, that then just like chucked me into anxiety, panic attacks. And I was very sick as a result of all the trauma that happened living a life like that. So and also as well, our family just didn't know what to do with me. They've never had a drug addict in their family. We didn't come from the wrong side of the railway tracks. And it was also like, you know, my mom didn't know what to do because it was just like what would the neighbors say. So it was very much, you know. 
like that. So there was no one to talk to. I just kind of like went through it on my own. And um, yeah, I mean, it was the it was the ultimate breaking. And I think that's where your journey really begins, you know, not knowing that in my younger self, but now I'm 48, I kind of understand, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So did you start with Egypt or did that come much later? No, that was okay. I'm going to like try and condense this down because this is a wild journey, man. So, so there I was in my drug. I'm a big storyteller as well. I love that. So those that hear my meditations, I can take you on a journey and I'm going to do just that now. So <laughs> rewind, drug addiction, broken to a million pieces. Probably had about two nervous breakdowns to date by that time. Eventually moved home. Parents started to like, you know, bring me home to look after me. Ended up starting this new job and these two, uh, this couple were like, why don't you come to Zimbabwe? We go out there every single year. We're inviting you out to Africa. You know what I mean? Just come. And I remember thinking, I don't know any of these people they're going with, but my mom and dad were like, listen, you're in such a hole. You've really, really got to do something to change the vibe. They lent me the money and they said, just go out to Zimbabwe. Just, just do something. So I went out. And I went out to Zimbabwe with uh, with this couple of friends and um, turned up at, um, in Zimbabwe, picked up from the airport by the sun to go and stay on this tobacco farm which with this older couple. Five days later, the son asked me to marry him. And it was like twin flame, love at first sight. So, you know, he just looked at me and was just like, you can come, but that drug addiction of yours and all your drama can't. So it was a real kind of like line in the sand thing. So, we, so my two week holiday turned into four weeks. Went home, told my mom, dad, I'm marrying a Zimbabwean, that's it, I'm out. My dad was like, you're crazy, you're still drug addicted, you're just a bit mad. And he's like, you aren't going anywhere. So he, he flew over. My husband, who's my husband now, flew over, asked my hand in marriage. My dad fought him the whole way, but eventually let me go. So six weeks later, we were married. And during that time, within the six weeks, I, I really got scared. Because, you know, twin flames were runners, eh? You know what I mean? My husband's always loved me unconditionally. I've been conditional. So I was already got my Nikes on ready to just gap it every single moment. And I was like, I can't marry this guy. I'm married to this guy. I can't marry him. I was just going through it. And then just as I got really scared and wanted to back out, found out I was pregnant. So then marriage, baby, being married to somebody I didn't know, stuck in Africa. Two minutes ago, I was on the dance floor at the rave scene. I was like, what is going on? So spirit just said, no, no, no. No, no. So that basically anchored me in Zimbabwe. Okay. And in a way I should have gone to rehab, but I think pregnancy and being on a farm full of farm invasions were happening at that time. So they were killing all of the farmers all around us. Here I am suffering with drug addiction, pregnant though, needing to dry out. Very, very lovely man I've married. Don't know him from a bar of soap. Like, honestly, it's like, think back to it, it's craziness. But I stayed, okay? And then five years later, had my daughter and, you know, the, the, we, we progressed. But during this time of me getting well, I decided to sign up to uh, sign up on a fitness course. And I became really good at being an exercise specialist, right? So I kind of like did a 19 year career in that. I ended up just studying to that. But the thing is, my addiction, I got addicted to exercise. I became a nutritionist. I got addicted to food. So that's where my path of spirituality started, because then I really started to recognize the, the habits, the repetitive, the repetitive energies. I thought, I'm not schnarfing cocaine anymore, or popping pills. I'm cured of addiction. And then meanwhile, I'm now addicted to exercise, addicted to food, addicted to everything else. So that's when I had to go, okay, there's something going on here. And I started to study healing. So then I started to heal myself. And of course, like, you know, one step led to another and, and I did start to move in the right direction. So I spent 15 years in Zimbabwe just getting better. Then I had this mad, crazy awakening. We were about to buy some land in, we bought the land in Zim and we were gonna buy, we're gonna build this massive wellness center. And that was my dream. So I was set up to go. Next month we were due to start building. It was like, oh my God, 19 years in the industry, I'm ready to just, you know, make my dream happen. And then Mother Mary came in and I was like quite into my spiritual path then. She was like, you gotta go. I'm like, what do you mean you gotta go? You have to leave Zimbabwe. You can't stay here. You need to go to Cape Town. And I ignored it and I ignored it. And you cannot ignore that spiritual awakening. When you gotta go, you gotta go. So the more I tried to ignore it, the more sick I got until I had I, I like acknowledged, right, I'm gonna move from Zimbabwe to Cape Town. I didn't know why. I just assumed I would just do another studio down here. No, when I came to Cape Town, that's when shit went, got really, really intense. Because when I came here, I thought all the studios were gonna open their doors to Marie, the amazing, extraordinaire, 
physical teacher and all this kind of stuff. No, it was it was a deep dive into my mission and purpose. I didn't even know anything about Egypt at that time. Wasn't even interested in it. And then when I came here, I was trying to get to Peru. Um, and I ended up in, in Ibiza on somebody's spiritual retreat. And somebody, a, a woman, Stasi, channeled this uh, message and said, Marie, you're going to Egypt. And I was like, no, I'm not. And then two months later, I was in Egypt. So that all teed up when I first moved to Cape Town. And I didn't even know I was there. Because like I said, I was trying to get to Peru. I wasn't interested in Egypt, but I thought, oh, well, I'll go there. And then I went back there again and again and again. <laughs> and that's kind of like where my relationship with Egypt started. But I, I went there the first two tours on somebody else's tour. And then the activations and the the initiations were intense and they were big. And then I really just started to just come online, you know, specifically with Egypt. So I walked a big initiation before I was able to take groups, let me tell you. You know, that was, you know, that was big. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> so let's talk about that for a little bit, the activations and the initiations. I've heard people mention the second, uh, the Sakim chamber. It, well, I believe it's in the king's chamber where it's kind of yes. built like a giant uh, jed pillar. <laughs> and there's, yes. I want to say there's a statue of Sekhmet in there. And I've heard a lot of people talk about the massive amounts of energy that's just in the room. Um, yeah. Can you in any way testify to just the energy of being in the area? <laughs> well, what is this the great pyramid you're talking about? The king's chamber? Uh, probably. Yeah. Okay. Well, well, I mean, like, you know, it, it, look, this is the way Egypt works, right? It's like, there are so many specific portals and places of power that like for you, Nelson, you might look at something and go, no, that's not for me, but I'll be like zinged by it. And like, I'll look at something going, no, that's not for me. And you'll be like crying tears. And that's why I say to everybody going to Egypt, you know, it's like you've left codes there that specifically scream your name. You just hear it. And you can walk into certain buildings or certain temples and they might not mean anything to me, but you'll be vibrating and you'll be on your knees just going, oh my God. Do you know what I mean? I've seen people have uh, flashbacks, past life flashbacks that I've gone to talk to them and they're on the floor writhing in pain. And it's been really intense because they just touched one of the walls in the Isis temple and all of this memory came back of extreme pain. And this is quite interesting because there's a lot of people that go back to the Isis temple particularly and they put their hands on the wall. We go into the Holy of Holies and it's it's always the women that have these very, very painful flashback of past life. And it's very traumatic for them and holding space for them when they go back to that place, which you would have thought the Isis temple is so beautiful. Do you know what I mean? It's like for some people, it's like that's the initiation. You've got to go back and finish what, what you started. But after that massive sudden purge and the tears come, Oh, the elevation and the rapid transformation is like huge, right? And it's like with the Great Pyramid as well. I mean, the Great Pyramid is like the Great Pyramid is my signature temple. If I could, if I could liken myself to any any sacred temple in Egypt, I would say I'm a Great Pyramid. Do you know what I mean? That's like that's who I am. And I always do the, the the private visits on my tour day one. Okay, so we do private visit at the Sphinx, and then we go straight into the um, Great Pyramid. Now. When you go into the, the pyramid, you go down, you go into the subterranean chamber, right? So you climb down into the depth. So, of course, the pyramid's there and you go down here. Now, that's an initiation in itself because the energy is so high. Your adrenaline's peaking and you're sweating and it's like a pilgrimage on its own. You're climbing through and you literally get spat out in the womb. I call it the womb, which is like the base underneath of the Great Pyramid. Now, there is so much supernatural power underneath there. My group that I took two groups ago, there was a, a couple of women that were sat on a certain part of the rock down there. And we took a picture and it was like swirling. So the vortexes are like massive. So on the picture, it looked like somebody just got their finger and whirled, whirled the imagery around. Now, the girl that had the picture taken of her, she said she was like in this vortex. She was just spinning and she didn't know why. And she couldn't get out of it because she, where she was sitting. Now, there's also like, you know, some uh, there's a there's a being down there, which is not Lyran. It's cat like, though. 
and I always feel its presence. And they say it's the guardian of the subterranean chamber. Um, but the energy down there, I mean, when I took my daughter down there on that same particular group, we went down and I said to Ava, my daughter, I said, right, you've got the GoPro, you've got your phone, you've got your uh, blogging camera, make sure they're all charged, which they were. She got in there, not, not even two seconds later, all the camera batteries wiped, up, wiped, gone, done. She was like, mom, we've got no power on anything. So it's like, there's a lot of energy there. And you know what I'm going to say? You've got to have respect for Egypt because it's not all good. Do you know what I mean? So you need to kind of like not throw your third eye on everything that you go into in, in Egypt. You've got to be discerning. You know what I mean? You've got to, you've got to like, you know, be, be careful kind of when you go to these places, which is why you need to hold your own space, you know? Um, I hold it for you, but you still need to hold your own. But the energy, like in some of the places, are potent, man. You'll just be in tears. You'll just be like, why am I crying? Especially when you get to the Sekhmet temple. I mean, she's she's our mom. So of course, anytime going home to see mom is going to be emotional. So I mean, like going to the Sekhmet temple, I just vibrate in anxiety, but it's good anxiety because I just can't stop crying. Because that's just that's just the power of, of, of her. She's magnificent, you know? Awesome. <clears throat> so you mentioned a bit earlier that you really got into healing. Um, so let's talk about that for a bit, the processes of healing. But specifically, I'd like to focus on the idea of shadow work and how dealing with the soul often leads to healing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, like for me, I just rem I mean, you're probably the same, actually, Nelson, because I think we're exactly the same how we work. I remember just like my, I look back on my life and I'm like constantly in the dark constantly in the shadow. And I'm like, oh man, I'll come up for a light reprieve and then and I go again. And I'm a shadow worker myself as well, you know? Um, I th and, and it's quite it's quite a funny old thing, isn't it? This These labels we give ourselves. Because when people say shadow worker, but I'm of the light, I'm a light worker. And I'm like, well, it's all the same at the end of the day because shadow is shadow. Everybody's got density. Everybody's got dark bits, you know what I mean? That need to be looked at. And I, I mean, this is just my belief, like I say, gospel according to Marie. I believe that when we come into the first half of our life, okay, we are meant to really live out the shadow of our soul purpose. So that's when all your stuff's going wrong and, you know, you're in the depths, right? And it's usually around about 30 years old-ish, you start to kind of like get a bit of a foot in the ladder and you're like, right, okay, let me I'll start to unpack this and understand it. And then that's when the gifts and the aha moments come, you know, that's how I believe it works. So for me, I do believe that we all come through with a soul shadow because it's the flip side of understanding what your soul gifts are. And I believe if you come in and you are you are seriously in 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 uh, loss. You're losing money. You're losing relationships. You lose houses, whatever. Just loss, loss, loss. Your superpower is abundance. Do you know what I mean? Like mine is is fear, and I believe that my one of like my biggest soul missions is to to combat fear, face fear, and transmute it into courage. And that's why Sekhmet is. I'm like who, you know, that's why we're so connected. So I feel that like my soul was definitely like, I think lifetime after lifetime after lifetime, I've, I've needed to get right with this extreme fear that Nelson has me paralyzed. It's had me paralyzed in this life. And I think it's been so tremendous that fear. I don't even know what, just life that I think my option was like, well, you know what, let me just get on some drugs and let me not be here. Do you know what I mean? That's a great way to fix that that plan. So I think that like, I think that we do come in with a massive soul shadow and that's okay because it's actually the portal that, that, that you know, unlocks why we came, which is what I call our power toolbox, you know? So yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. that's a major part because like I grew up in more of a Christian arena. So I'm used to seeing people not work on themselves at all and still get the religious stuff done. <laughs> <laughs> so you have a room full of hundreds of broken people who are all denying their destiny, working on a project together that never gets done. <laughs> <laughs> it's like everyone's Church. using the hammer backwards. <laughs> you're drilling the floor. <laughs> you're beating the pipe. It's like, we look busy. Nothing's getting done, though. <laughs> like, I've been coming here for 40 years. You're the same. <laughs> no actual work's being done. So when you actually start to get to the roots, it's like, okay, where are you really running from? Ah, there it is. 
<laughs> yeah. There it yeah. is. And a person will go through what seemingly took them 40 years and 40 minutes. Yeah. Just because oftentimes it's avoiding the inevitable and most people know what it is they're avoiding, which is yeah. why they avoid it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because it's painful. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I get that a lot. I mean, like, I probably not one of my best super, my best uh, attributes, but I get really segment when I can feel that, like, there's a lack of authenticity. Do you know what I mean? And I mean, I struggled with that for years before I was even connected to segment. And I would see others and I'd be like, you know, and do you know what my biggest thing is, is, is in it, it really, it really does strike a chord with me that where, where people that are holding space for others haven't got the courage to go and look at their shadow. If if you're holding space for others, it is, it's imperative, absolutely imperative that you have to do the work on yourself. And, and you know, it, it's like you can't not. And it's actually quite surprising as to how many people out there who are holding space for many other people cannot go and do their shadow work. You know what I mean? So, of course, the people that are holding space for are suspended, if you like. Do you know what I mean? And it's a great responsibility doing this work. And I do not take it lightly. And I'm sure you're exactly the same because sometimes the responsibility is something I just wish I hadn't chosen half the time. But there's the kind of like cross that we have to bear because the mission does get heavy, doesn't it? I mean, yeah. it's like, you know, for us to be this um, and it's not about us being leaders or, you know, gurus. It's about like, you know, well, if we're going to lead us all to the promised land, you know, what I do for myself, I do for others. We all kind of need to have that attitude so we can all arrive together. Now, if you've got a space holder and they've got people around them and they're not willing to do their shadow work, that that stops that process in, in the, you know, in the tracks. So essentially it's like, come on guys, it is painful. It is sore. No one wants to look at their pain because it's, it's traumatic. It's, it's, yeah. it's heavy but you know we have to we have to do it don't we do you know what i mean and that's why we we're here you know i've lost yeah. many friends or more so postponed many relationships simply because i was willing to move forward and they said i'm not ready for that yet <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Where it's like because yeah. i understand that spiritual progress often means that i kind of have to divorce my current it might come yeah. back later, but I kind of have to get rid of everything that's around me now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's part of the chaotic nature of growth and evolution is that the only way that you keep what's around you is if what's around you comes with you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But what's around you has free will and can choose to stay if it wants. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So that it's is like, so love you, but I can't stay back here. I'm going to go insane if I stay down here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and that's, that's look, the whole twin flame thing. I believe we're all twin flames because we all have masculine and feminine frequencies. I believe there's twin flame frontliners. I call us the frontliners. We're the ones that we're going to bash the doors down. I call it the penguin process. This is Marie. Welcome to Marie's brain. The penguin process is if you watch them on an iceberg, they're all dancing around. No one's doing anything. A bit like your church people you're talking about. Nobody's doing anything. They're all penguins dancing on the, on the iceberg. And then all of a sudden one's like, bugger this. I'm gone. One jumps and then they all get jump. Do you know what I mean? And it's like, I believe we're those first penguins, Nelson, where we're like, oh, I don't want to do this. The yeah. water's cold. There's killer whales in there. But you know what? Can't stay here because this iceberg's really small. So we jump, right? And then we give the people the courage to kind of access and activate their own twin flame because they're like, well, they're doing it. But let's go. Do you know what I mean? And it's like, I, even with my husband, like I've been married to my twin flame. We didn't know that we were, I don't even like using that word because it's actually got quite, distorted but you know what I mean sacred counterpart um we've been married for 24 years 23 24 years and you know we didn't know that who we were until nine years ago when he was supposed to move here fully from Zimbabwe and he didn't come and then of course I was like why is this happening 15 years into a marriage like what's going on and then that's when we started to dive into we went through all of the things it could be and then we're like wow but this twin flame thing I honestly thought that we weren't going to make it and the biggest thing, and the reason I'm bringing this up is, he is a Zimbabwean. Zimbabweans are very much creatures of habit. They just want to be in the bush on the Zambezi River, taking a beer and just fishing and just chilled, simple life, which is actually a good thing for me because I'm a bit, bit loopy. So like it's nice and grounded, but 
He doesn't move dynamically like I do because I'm like, right, let's find another iceberg. Let's go. Let's work. You know, he don't like that. So, of course, I'm his biggest trigger and mirror and he's mine because he don't want to move and I don't want to stay. Do you know what I mean? So it's like so we had this thing where we had this push and pull. And in the end, the very thing that saved my marriage, I was looking, I was thinking, right, I think we're going to go to the divorce courts. I don't know. I don't know how else. Like we were just stuck. And I said to him, I said, you know what? I can't stay here. I choose my purpose and I, if you're not part of my purpose, I've made peace with that, but I've got to move forward. And as soon as I did that, it's like somebody came and just wah, cut those chains. And then that's when we started to work. When I let go of that codependency and saying, well, I don't have to stay back here. It was like, there you go. You've passed the test now. Right. Let's get on to the next one. And I was like, wow, that was like huge. That was the difference of, of me and him evolving into the next level. Because when he let, when I let him go, he let me go. So he lived his life in Zimbabwe playing golf, having a great time. Comes for me at weeks at a time. We have a great time. I get my alone time. He gets his alone time. On paper, the most dysfunctional relationship ever. People are like, that's a bit weird. They're married. And like, you know, but my marriage has never been the, like as good as it has because he's happy. He's seen to his needs. I'm seeing to mine. We're not codependent. And it's because I chose me. And I think husband, wife doesn't matter. If you're not choosing you, then like you say, your your path stays stagnant, right? I would say. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I've, I've seen a lot of missions, spiritually organized missions fail simply because the people who were supposed to forerun and lead those chose each other over the movement. Right. They're like, I think we'll stay friends and we'll just do nothing together. At least I have you. And it's like, <laughs> ah, you just doomed the whole area. Yes. <laughs> now no one gets to move on. The only two yeah. people with the ability to break down the barrier yeah. Chose to hug at the door. <laughs> yeah, exactly. How <laughs> Yay, nice. Y'all have your friendship, and now this area that now the crime rate and the drug rate increases. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, you got to start over. One job. Great. <laughs> now, now, now I have more work to do. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's the frustration, isn't it? You know, like obviously not being judgmental or anything like that, but it's like, it does get like that. And I think that like, I think you and I, I love the way you speak about this, Nelson, because I think it's real talk, you know? And, I, and you know, I always go on my channel, like talking about like, you know, well, let me just rewind. I had a, there the, the, in Avalon, there's um, a, a goddess called Lady of the Lake. She's mm -hmm. very beautiful. Not Lady Avalon, she's called Lady of the Lake. And she's the lady that um, gave the Excalibur, I think, to Arthur. But anyway, she came through one day and she came through me and I just heard this voice, which I don't usually hear that strong a channel, you know, but this day was particularly resound. And she said, because I'm always feeling like I'm failing because I'm not one for... 60 million followers. In fact, that gives me anxiety. I'm not one for big groups. I don't want to teach to group big groups. I want to keep it intimate. So I can say, how are you doing, Nelson? How, how was your journey? How are you feeling after that? Tell me what's going on. I, and I like to connect. So when we're working with big groups, it's like a mass consciousness. And I, I miss my connection. It's not my sweet spot. I know some people are amazing like that, but it's not mine. But the fact that I don't have massive groups, I always thought maybe that's a failure. So as a star seed kind of like on the mission, I was like, I'm failing every day. I'm failing because, you know, you're looking left and then you're looking right and you're, you're seeing what everybody else is doing. You're like, but I'm not doing that. But it's weird because I don't want to do that. And then she came through and she said, between the cracks is where the power is. She said, we need to desensitize the Jesus complex. And I was like, Jesus complex. And she said, well, she said, um, you know, everybody's put the teacher on a pedestal, which means when you're up there, you know, people hang on your every word. She said, the only way that you're going to desensitize that is by being a real person on a level that they can actually, you're tangible. There's always going to be an element when you are teaching that people are like, oh, it's amazing. It's like, no, we have problems. I say fuck a lot. Sorry, I'm not allowed. I don't know whether I can say that on here. You can bleep it out. <laughs> Sorry. But I do, I swear. And I might I might have a gin and tonic. Do you know what I mean? But I keep it real. Because the thing is, it's like, don't, don't glorify me or anyone else for that matter, because we're all just trying to figure it out together. So if we have that attitude, then all of a sudden I reflect a realness back to you, going, Well, 
I don't have to be perfect then to share that thing that I channeled in my journal the other day. Oh, I don't have to be this perfectly marketed spiritual teacher. You just go out there and share your creativity, you know? And I think what happens is we we have this um this this gap between us and the teachers. And that's what that lady Avalon was saying when she came through. And she was like, keep going through the cracks because the cracks is where the darkest places are, but the darker the place, the bigger the transformation. And she yeah. said, crack those pods as it were, because that's where the big teachers are sitting and they will come and assist you and help you as um, powerful pods of activation for others who can, you know, because you can't do this on your own. We can't just have a few of us thinking like this. We need others. And she said, find them in the cracks of the pavement. Don't be yeah. scared to go there. And only small things can get in those cracks. So don't think you're failing. Do you know what I mean? And I was like, wow, that gave me such a confidence where I was like, I'm okay. I'm doing exactly what I said I signed up, what I signed up for. I'm fulfilling it. Because I think that's the biggest thing as starseeds that we think we're failing the mission. And that makes us very sad, you know? Yeah. So yeah. in similar vein for me, like speaking of doing work just because your spirit led and not because it's something you want to do, YouTube yeah. is that for me. I don't like being on camera. Oh, really? <laughs> really? So <laughs> here you are. <laughs> if it was up to me, I wouldn't be doing this, but I consider it in the same vein as Catherine Kuhlman. <clears throat> So many other people were supposed to do this and said no. And I believe I'm like 30th in line and said yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Catherine yeah. Kuhlman would often say that big healing ministry, massive help to the world. They're like, why do you think they'd ask her, why do you think God chose you? And she says, I don't think I was the first person God asked, nor do I think I'm the second or the third. <laughs> I think I'm just <laughs> one down the line somewhere that eventually said yes. <laughs> exactly and how nice is that that's like it I can just feel the energy is that landing with me that that's like oh that's there's some normalcy to that there's some magical normalcy if you know what I mean because we're all magical yeah. but that's the thing because we all want to be the chosen one I suppose don't we you know what I mean and I think that's where spirituality has got we're all trying to be like it makes me laugh we're all trying to be so unique and do something different but we're already unique why are you trying to be something you already are and I had that the other day um I was like, in fact, it was Saturday morning. I think there's a, been a big energy that's open this weekend. There must be some geostorms going on. I don't know. But I tell you what, I got taken by spirit on Saturday morning and I got seriously nauseous. And I think it's all these energies of the eclipses coming in and everything. But I just got, the, I got this message when I was actually lay starfish underneath my oak tree on the ground because I didn't know what else to do because it felt so awful. And this, this voice just said, why are you healing yourself? Why are you doing that? Why are you healing yourself? You're not broken. You know, who told you you're broken? You just got to say yes. Why are you pretending that you don't know who you are? You're just pretending. You know what I mean? Just stop pretending and say yes. And then you don't have to keep healing yourself because you're quite fine. You know that. And I was like, oh, okay. And it always makes me laugh that like, that's, the, that's how simple it is, isn't it? Really? Look, it's easier said than done. I understand yeah. that. But just it's truth. It is truth. You know, taking the layers off of that. You know, I'd say a large portion of it is getting comfortable with the chaos. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Because uh, yes. typically we're taught that if chaos is happening, we need to put it into it. In a lot of cases is getting in sync with it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Be one with the sometimes it is put it into the chaos. Sometimes that yeah. is the thing. So, sometimes you have to fight Seth. Other times you have to fight with Seth. Or, right. or at the very least, like let that. Seth fight for you. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's um, like, I love that. I absolutely love that because that is just like, that's so true. Do you know, you and I just talk about exactly the same things. Like he's like, kind of like, I don't know. It's like, it's just masculine and feminine coming together. I, like I say, I'm sure we have chats in the astral and you're like, right, I'm going to talk about this on my show. And I'm like, well, I'm going to do the same. Because this is exactly what I was saying. You know, it's like chaos. I was saying we're conditioned by the world that chaos is a bad thing. Chaos is impending doom. Chaos means everything is out of control. You're in danger, right? But the ancient teachings is chaos is divine feminine, right? Now, Keridwin, who's one of my guides I work with, yeah, it's it's like, it, it, it's a good thing. Get your surfboard and go for it. Get on top of that wave or be slammed on the beach, whatever. But it's just like I, um, uh, Keridwin, who's um, a Celtic goddess, and she's uh, basically, she's the witch before they demonized her, um, uh, the witch and the maiden. 
and she's very she's like the same as she's the same as Sekhmet and she's the keeper of Awen. Awen is um you know transformation um inspiration all of the things and she works with the cauldron so she's very much about fire cauldron transformation same as Sekhmet and of course Sekhmet is fire in the belly but it's they're both dark mothers and um, she's got her cauldron and it is always in a state of chaos, always in a state of chaos. Now, the ancients regarded cauldrons as magical vessels, right? Because it's also indicative of the womb and indicative of us, all this kind of thing. And as her cauldron's in a state of chaos, she takes her finger and she swirls the Celtic spiral in there. And as soon as she does that, she activates the chaos into manifestation. So it's almost like, well, it's it's one of the recipes. It's one of the ingredients that we need to be able to create. So like you say, we're conditioned to hide from chaos when actually it could be the very thing that kind of gets you through the door, right? You know? Yeah. yeah. Like dealing with, like we keep mentioning segment. Uh, actually, before we started recording, I called Set uh, a mama's boy. <laughs> <laughs> yes. His chaos comes from mom. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's just a yeah. masculine form of her chaos. Yeah. She's chaos in femininity. He's chaos in masculinity as an offspring. So yeah. he's just the mama's boy. Yeah. yeah. When you're dealing with the duality that makes us, you have the yin and the yang, and we're all some some uh, percentage of Tai Chi. <laughs> yeah. Both of them yeah. mixed together. It, we're some percentage, yeah. a little yin, a little yang. Yeah more of this one or the other but we're all a percentage of it yeah and like the idea of being only in or only yang is faulty they yeah. actually need each other to balance out and to produce anything that gets anything done yeah it's yeah like that's why we have the sacred feminine fully uh represented by the yin and the masculine fully represented by the yang Nothing gets done until they work together. <laughs> right. Just like I recently put like, on yeah. Facebook something I've been teaching because people have been asking what happens when an unstoppable force meets an immovable object. I said, that's when we're born. <laughs> that ah. is our mom and dad. <laughs> yeah. Wow. That's when the powerful. yin meets the yang, you show up. <laughs> yeah. More of yeah. yourself begins to develop. So our journey for the most part is learning how to balance and tap into deeper and deeper levels of the haves that make us yeah. whole. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. And and I think you and I, I think you and I both come from the school of Toth as well as many other schools. It's just listening oh, yeah. to you. It's like, yep. Yeah. I'm like, yep, 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 yep. Like, yeah, I mean, cool <laughs> yeah, no, he's like, he's a dude, man. We love Toth because he, he's basically for me the same as Merlin. You know, Merlin and Toth. I mean, isn't it funny that like you can actually cross pollinate these gods because essentially everything's one anyway. Do you know what I mean? But it's mm -hmm. like, but us humans, we like labels. Um, but I've got a massive Merlin statue on my desk now as he stares at me now with his staff. Um, but I find Merlin and Toth very, very much the same, you know. And I think that like you and I teach from ascend Ascension Ladders, which is I love the way that you explain and teach things because like I find that like the ancient teachings have been lost and they're extremely assistive, meaning a chakra system is a is an Ascension la ascension Ladder. You know, the the, the twin flame trine, like I'm, I'm teaching with uh, Ma'at and um, Sekhmet and Hathor at the moment. Do you know what I mean? And it's like learning how to take the, the, the fire of Sekhmet, her element with Hathor's water and be under the banner of Ma'at and how you kind of like, you know, and that's very assistive when you can bring some kind of order to energy. And when I explain, and you'll probably find the same as well with your teachings, when I explain this to people, well, if you add that to that, it equals that. All of a sudden people get it. And I think up until now, we've been kind of like fumbling through just being spiritual and shit and just like gonna meditate, gonna go and do yoga. And then I might go and do an ayahuasca and then actually not know what the hell went on in the journey and be really messed up by that journey for about a year because I didn't do the integration. And it's like, but because because we're just following blindly because that's kind of what we have to do. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you know, well, hang on a minute. Let's just pause and rewind and like really access what's already around us. Like Mary Magdalene says, everything is hidden in plain sight. Mm 
A mm -hmm. tree is an ascension ladder, right? If we talk about the tree of life, you know, the mm -hmm. root systems, are your roots deep? Start there, okay? Strong winds, are you going to fall over? And I always talk about how the trunk is kind of like the core of you. That's the soul of like, you know, know who you are, know your craft. And then, of course, like the branches, like your different expressions, how you can turn up in the world. And then we all of a sudden understand it differently because we don't worry about creations anymore because that's all the fruit that's hanging on your trees, which, by the way, if you don't pluck them, They'll just fall into the ground and you'll suck them up through your roots again and reproduce them. No such thing as missed opportunities. So when we explain the path, like the oak tree that's in my garden, which I'm looking at now, all of a sudden people are like, well, that's okay. That's quite, quite simple. And I'm like, yeah. bring ascension ladders back, man. <laughs> you know? And I believe part of it's because a lot of the, what is now labeled only spirituality was just a part of regular education back in the ancient world where yeah. they used the same figures to explain different concepts because they, in a way, represented certain principles. So yeah. you'd see Sekhmet, you'd see Heteru, you'd see Ma'at. Depending on how they were used, you could be in the middle of science class and they're just talking about chemistry. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Oh, <laughs> Exactly. We're not so, that far away from it. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like, it's not, it's more so we're more comfortable with the spiritual aspects, but they're multifaceted. Um, something yeah. I teach on is the sacred drama where you'll yeah. see the same story play out in different planes of existence yeah. in the spirit, in the astral, in the cosmic, in the forces of nature. And in some cases acted out throughout humanity. Yeah. Um, like you and the whole time you could give the same attributes or you can name the same attributes, the same name, like. Um, Tiamat, right. Known as the original mother <laughs> in yeah. the Sumerian culture, at least that's the great mother um, in her purest, most chaotic form. Mother of all creatures. Well, there's a spiritual application of, like I said, yin in its purest form. But then there's talking about ancient history. It's believed by a lot, by a fair amount, that Earth, Mars, and the asteroid belt all used to be one big planet known as Tiamat that was later oh. broken up by another planet, which they now call Marduk. So you have the same story being played out on a cosmic scale which may very well have happened on a spiritual level, wow. which may yeah. also play out just depending on the different archetypes you're using in just your earthly life and experience. It's like, yeah. oh, I just had a Marduk versus Tiamat situation, but <laughs> could be the origin of the planet we're on, could also be an actual history of entities that are millions of years away. Yeah. You have the same thing repeating in a way because it's following a formula. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I, I believe that. And I, and I think, do you think that, <clears throat> do you think that we've evolved, which is why we're able to talk about the ascension ladders and we're thinking, because I feel like, like put it this way, what's the book called again? I've got it on my bookshelf there. It's the um, Flower of Life, the ancient secret of the Flower of Life. I think everybody in their spiritual path has either known about that book or read it. And I remember the first time I picked it up, I opened the pages and I was like, what the actual Batman is this guy talking about? I was just like, I don't understand any of this. And I was just like, no, my brain can't compute this. Whereas my sister had read it back to front to back, no problem. Now, some years later, I picked it up. And then I was just like, oh, no, I get this. Like the, the Emerald Tablets of Toth. I can read that yeah. now like a Disney novel. Whereas before, I remember, used to be reading it like a four-year-old going, thou us, do us, of manus. And I'd be like, God, this is really hard. Do you know what I mean? So, so I think that, like, I suppose I've answered my own question. We've evolved ever such a lot because, obviously, we now can have these conversations of spiritual science because I feel that one has to have a basic knowledge, if not quite in depth, to be able to play the game. Because I'm actually in the middle of um, actually writing bits and pieces. I think I might be writing a book. I don't know. I'm just writing stuff. And I am writing um, about the game, capital G-A-M-E, how to play it. Because essentially, this game we're playing 
is like essential ascension ladders. It's snakes and ladders, isn't it? Really, if you want to put it down to that, it's like it's no different to naked and afraid. You've been dumped in the Amazon jungle with nothing but a Hessian satchel, and you've got to find your way back home, you know? And it's like that's essentially what all of these things are. You've got to play the game. And you were talking about the principles. And if you don't understand the principles, like the seven hermetic principles, or have a basic idea about it, or even know what the chakras do if you put them together as a ladder. It's hard. It's really hard to understand stuff, isn't it? You know? Yeah. Yeah. Because that's one of the drawbacks many people have. It's the idea that something outside of myself is the answer. <laughs> yeah, exactly. When, uh, that's something me and Sadhguru agree on is that there's no better technology in the universe than the human body. That right. we literally have everything that we need in us is just that we don't know it. That's why I often consider Earth like uh, you mentioned the star seeds, and I want to talk about that after this. But I'm like, if there are all these other races, I'm pretty sure Earth is the special needs class. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I see us. I'm like, we we're in the middle of a reset now. Like the ancient world is, was much more advanced than we are now. It, we went backwards, but we're starting to come back up. It's, it's like, there's a few good kids out of the rest, you know, everyone else. Absolute is eating. explosion of ADD yeah. is going on right now in adults. Yeah. I'm one of them. Yeah. They're <laughs> eating blue and they're, they're, they're chewing on the crayons. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the rest of creation is still waiting for us to, to help out. <laughs> yeah, they're like, oh, anytime soon, guys. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. So talk a bit about the starseed concept, because I usually don't get people on that know anything about it. I heard you mention the Lyrans before. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, like, look, it's like, gosh, debating this is like debating uh, religion, veganism and parenting. It's always a little bit of a minefield, isn't it? Do you know what I mean? But for me, I always say, I love that you brought that up, that everything is inside of us. That I'm like gospel of a man, take it or leave it. Everybody's got a gospel and that's what we should be speaking from right now. So that's where I'm coming from. So for yeah. me, um, I am, I do understand that there are like, uh, when the more I read up on this, the more I see that there's loads of different versions of us. Like you can have like um, an earth, um, an earth walker, like you have the star seeds and you have like, you know, um, like angels and it's all different. It's all different frequencies. But the thing is, I'm an Egyptian kind of chick. All right. That's my lineage. And I believe everyone's from the stars. I do. You know, and I know they say like, you know, you can all be like um, more of Gaia or the elementals or whatever, but go back even beyond the elementals. Where was the, or, or, you know, where are the origin source codes? in everything it's the stars before the the world was even born you know what i mean from the big bang or whatever like you know it was born from you know sources breath do you know what i mean whatever but it's like we all came from the stars we came from we come from star magic and that's just how i feel about everything so that's why um i, I think that the, we have all been on many many different star star places because this is where it all comes in um where i'm like yeah i'm very 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 uh, Sirius. I know I'm from Sirius, but that's my most recent, probably most prominent incarnation recently. But, and I believe that, that's why we say, oh, I'm prominently Palladium, because maybe that was the most recent place you've just come from. But then it could just be that you just played in all the way through, man, you're team Palladium, you know, who knows? But I do believe that we've been a lot of it. And that's why we can read certain attributes about it and go, yeah, I'm a little bit that, a little bit that. But why I always, where I always end up as is like consciousness. We all come from the same thing. Because let me tell you, I got a brain that can decode and dissect and it gets me into a lot of trouble sometimes because this very, very powerful scientific brain can sometimes take the lead and I have to like slow it down a little bit, you know? And then when I start to like really decode this stuff, I just come back to the same answer that it doesn't really matter. And we're all basically one. Do you know what I mean? But I do, I do feel if we've got to give it a label that we're all from the stars, you know, I believe mm -hmm. that. Yeah. yeah. And I believe that's part of why they find stardust in our, in our human bodies. Now <laughs> they've yeah. been able to trace back the same elements that make us make up stars. So it even goes to the idea that we're stars in physical form. I think so because the Egyptians put yeah. it into poetry where they're yeah. saying, 
Uh, when the Bible mentions that a bunch of stars were taken for heaven, that was you and I. <laughs> Love it. That gives me goosebumps. You see, there's a truth bump rush, you know. And I mean, right. like I, I was blown away, like when it got spoken about if you if you put both arms and legs out and your head, you're a five pointed star in all of the temples in Egypt or most of them. There is one beautiful ceiling in Queen Hatshepsut's temple. It's really preserved. And when you look up, it's just blue paint and it's got a millions of stars that they've etched in the ceilings. Because every time you look up, that's who you are. You know what I mean? Like the Milky Way is a reflection of the Nile. So that's what the, the Egyptians believed, right? With this constant reflection as above, so below. So, you know, I'm, and, and then I kind of think about these labels and everything like that. And I think, well, you know, we all have uh, we all have wisdoms that come through. And I think that like we need to respect that. You know what I mean? So if you feel that you're more of an elemental and everything like that, don't let anybody tell you any different. At the end of the day, your truth is your truth. And I want to just chuck that into the mix because I have been quite tired of being force fed who I am. And it's yeah. like, that's where the switch happened, which is what you brought up beautifully before. Listen to your own gospel. I'm sat here banging on about how we're all stars, but if you're watching this and thinking, but no, I really, really know that I feel that I'm actually of this race or whatever then then embrace that and do you know what i mean like because that's your truth and don't let anybody tell you any different you know so yeah yeah 100 yeah. percent mm. yeah so i guess my question my next question is what does spirituality look for you look like for you now on a personal level is it a lot of uh, exercises? Is it just living life and whatever happens, happens? A mix of both? What does it really look like for you? God, Nelson, you're asking me right now where I'm going through an absolute panel beating. <laughs> and I don't care to share that because that's where transformation come from. And I'm here for it. And I'm saying that out loud because I'm really tired. <laughs> <Do you know? laughs> but I mean, like, in truth, okay, it's been well, let's just keep it real. They said 2024 was going to be the year of transformation. And I always knew transformation was going to be painful because I liken it to these beautiful moths that we get here. They, they, they hatch. And when they hatch through their chrysalis, then all of a sudden they chill on the tree for hours because they're exhausted because they're, yay, I'm born. But then they have to rest. And I think that that's what this year is all about. So it's kind of being quite chaotic in there's so much falling away and there's so much coming online that you are really challenged to kind of like sift through that and find your truth. And I'm going to get to my truth now. So I obviously run my tours to Egypt and I've, I've, I've been doing this putting this idea together and working on this mission for about three, four years now. And I'm a one man band doing everything on my own. The initiations I've been through, the amount of times I've wanted to put this mission down is too much, it's too heavy, too much, too stressful. I don't have anybody helping me and I've tried. And it's brought me to my knees in the past three, four years. Where I've arrived to now, the big realization on it, was they were like, it ain't about the tours. It's not even about the offerings that you bring. It's about your own joy and your happiness. And what I've all of a sudden deep dived into, like, and really found value in is being a starseed mom. My kids are 18 and 23. And even though they're babies and I, I brought them up and everything like that, the importance and the dedication and devotion I have for holding space for them to, to, to uh, willingly find their way on their own. I'm there, but I need them to not be through Marie's filter. I need them to be their own starseeds in their own right. You know, my son's 21, between 20, well, sorry, he's 23 now, but he, between the ages of 21 and 23, he lost his purpose. That's a young age to go through that. You know what I mean? He was just like, I don't know where I'm going. He was a pro cricketer and now he's he's finding his way now. My daughter's a very powerful, sensitive, wanting to leave the planet a lot. And I've just like stood there steadfast, you know, I'm more of a spirit guide and mother rather than just like, oh, let me take it away. You know what I mean? And it's also as well, my marriage and just that whole collective and I've overlooked that because I don't see the success in that because I've been too locked in on the tours, the Egypt, get the people to the temple on time. And then all of a sudden it was flip moded to me in the last couple of months. And it was like priorities, my dear priorities, that will be fine. It will all be fine, but stop and take stock as to where your real joy, essence and heart really is. And why you really came here was to give love and be loved. And that even gets me quite emotional. And that's my husband, it's my kids. 
all the beautiful people in my life that I look, I think we all this year went through a really big cleanup. We were like, nope, you can't be in my space anymore. I know that I removed a lot of people, places and situations out of my space. And I think this is why I've got this big reveal. It's simple, isn't it, Nelson? It, it's simple that like you already have what you were so busy fighting for. It's right here, you know? So it's like I've been reevaluating and re kind of like looking at everything and 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 kind of maybe re shuffling things around. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah. So, so that for me, I think that's where I am on my path right now is I think the real center of you is, is that, is that family. And I say family, not just like marriage, kids and all the rest of it. I'm talking about family like this. You and I are star family. We started talking straight away. Sure. Good conversations with good people that make you feel good. And then you come away feeling alive and happy. That's what it's about. Do you know what I mean? So yeah, yeah that's how I'm feeling right now. <clears throat> And that's how I know we have the same mother, because uh, that's the gospel of Sacrament. <laughs> Love and family. <laughs> she, she she gets branded as the ferocious one, but she's a lot more gentle than people give her credit for. All, all she is so. is a representation of, of pure and un, uncontrollable, unconditional love. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a protective <laughs> energy specifically for family, friends yeah. and relationships and things like that. <laughs> fighting fiercely for that and it's so gosh you just landed this because i've just had a bit of an aha moment so not this this year my son came to egypt with me the year before i took my daughter and i remember when i took my daughter i walked into sekhmet's chapel and i had ava i said come ava and i walked in and we both stood there and we both burst into tears and there's this beautiful photo of me hugging my daughter and we are crying uncontrollably. And Ava is not really into the spiritual. She is, but she doesn't sit in meditation every day. I've never forced her to. She's just grown up around it. So she gets it. But she's like, no, nah, mom, don't let me sit. And I don't want to be in ceremony. It's fine. Cool. So I walk into the, the chapel with my daughter, Ava. And I, I look I look at Sekhmet and I say, Sekhmet, I bought my cub. This is my cub. I was so happy and so proud. I just started to cry. And I look at Ava and she is just crying. And then the guard came in and put his arms around us. The key, you know, the, he's the custodian of Sekhmet. And then the next thing I know, we're doing a massive ceremonial circle. And Ava, who was just like, no, I'm not doing this spiritual stuff. She's in the Sekhmet chapel and everybody's got her in the center of the circle. And she's holding the light through the ceiling. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, so you didn't want to get involved then, didn't you? So there she is right, right in the center of ceremony. But I took Ava last year and then I took Bevan this year. And, and I now realize why I did it. And thank you, because you've just, you've just dropped that in for me, Nelson. I was like, ha, huh, okay, yeah, it was bringing that Sekhmet frequency through what I've just said, family, 100%, yeah. you know? Because, like, that's part of what you were just saying, which is the pretty much the massive detox the whole planet was just under for the entire year. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> we were all and in it, a, a detox. And nothing, yeah. pretty much nothing from 2023 made it, is, is making it to 2025. <laughs> we, we pretty much all had to start over. <laughs> 100% and no one was exempt, eh? No one yeah. was exempt. I remember like, saying to my friend in, in March, oh, I think I'm good. I've done a lot of work on myself. I think, and it wasn't like an ego thing. I truly thought, well, there can't be any more. And then there I am like, ooh, there's more. <laughs> it's always yeah. more. And it's it different for us because for me, like I said, I don't like doing the media stuff. Like, I've been saying this for since I started. I'm trying to work myself out of a job, which is why I give away so many high level secrets for cheap, pretty much. <laughs> no, I opened a school this year. That, that's what oh, that looks like for me. That, that's bye bye yeah. to disappearing. I now have a school. <laughs> Brilliant. Mystery school. I love it. I'm going to cheers to that with my coconut water. 100%. Yeah. That's what it's all about, you know? I'm like, I, and as you can see, all I do is hear other people's story at, for a living. And whether they say it on camera or off, they're like, yeah, we're going through a rough transition. Yeah, we're going through a rough transition. Yeah, we're going through a rough transition. Yeah. I'm like, it's all of us. It's, it's specifically yeah. between the Hebrew year. Like, we're coming up to the uh, end of the year slash new year in a few weeks. Um, I think it's, what's that, Rosh Hashanah? Yeah. Okay. The year is changing, so we might get some slack after that because it's pretty much the, the final birth. It, it's a birthing process for the most part. It is. And I had a vision the other day. I was actually meditating 
And I got this big energy jolt in my vision. And I, I remember seeing like my belly burst with water. <laughs> I didn't even put it together until later when I was journaling. And I was like, death, rebirth. <gasps> oh, God, water's breaking. And that's obviously what the message was. So let's say, people, when we know when the water's breaking, it ain't that much longer. Do you know what I mean? It's like, you know, we're like sitting at two centimeters dilated, um, you know, and it's, it is, it's, it's, it's close. I mean, look, there will always be more to work on, obviously, but I think that the foundational, the foundation's in, you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. One of the Definitely. benefits of this year, I feel like it's made people actually be honest with their priorities. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. before we could say, oh, I'm I'm, act I'm actively doing all of this. Well, this year came around and was like, no, I'm going to make everything so hard to do. You're going to be honest with us. <laughs> yeah. You're going to be honest with the people. You're going to be honest with yourself about what you're actually giving time and energy to. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And 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 no filter. You can't you can't avoid it. Do you know what yeah. I mean? And do you know what's so funny is my husband's very he's the opposite to me. He's very, very quiet, staunch, real kind of like strong energy to be around, but he doesn't do the energy work actively like I do. He'll never be sat behind the altar with me, put it that way. And that's okay. But he doesn't do this. So so he and he never gets sick. And he had high fever three times in a row to the point where he was like, babe, I don't know whether I'm going to make it for the night. And I was like, Jesus, what are you talking about? And it was like, if you can't process it that way, spirits like bring the fever. Let Sekhmet yeah. comes in with that fire just to kind of like transmute all of the energy. Right. Yeah. So it's fever like, is yeah. one of her manifestations. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And yeah, so he was sick. And like I say, he's never had a day off work in, in all of the time I've been married to him. And now he's there like, you know, oh, he's going through it, man. Do you know what I mean? It's like, yeah. So yeah. I think everybody went through that because there was a huge bout of fever that went through many of us, I think. I had it big time when I came back from Egypt. We, the last, each year we go, there's like a different mission. So it's not like a teach the same or anything like that. It's, it's who turns up in the space dictates what the mission is if you know what i mean i start to get a, a sense of like oh that person's come in and that's and then i start to get downloads and i'm like right okay this year we're building this you know and then last year when we went it was very much to do with the divine feminine and it was seven women only and it was very it was to do with sexual trauma and all this kind of stuff so anyway the following year meaning this year a lot of married couples came and it was a perfect balance between the same amount of men and the same amount of women. And it was all about receiving and how the masculines supported the women. Like we would be singing and the men would stand behind. Do you know what I mean? Just slowly walking behind us, you know. And when we were in the women's circle, they would come in and sing for us and stuff like that. So there was this beautiful merging. And it was very, very twin flame frequency, the divine balance. And now, of course, I've called like this month, and I know you're going to agree, is the month of Ma'at because it's it's a nine month, right? So it's basically balanced those scales, man. Tick tock. We're in September now, October, November, December. We've got to get right for next year. So, so yes, yeah, so I look at that tour that was in May. That, that huge thing, they even put me in the center of the circle so I could receive, because this is a space holder, you know what it's like, Nelson, you just, your mission is get the people to the temple on time, get it done. Never do they turn around and say, no, no, you, you need to come here. No, I don't. Do you know what I mean? What are you doing? And I felt really awkward and weird about receiving. So anyway, on the tour, I ended up receiving. And then I came back. I was starting to get sick on the last day or so. And then by the time I got back to Cape Town, I was in bed, man, fever, two weeks, bro. I was in bed, fever and the chest, the heart, the whole bang shoot. So yeah, it's like no one, no one escaped that upgrade. No one, you know? Mm -hmm. So yeah, next level, man. Yeah. Yeah. Like one of the things that like I can recognize the Maatian energy in a way is because of, well, the Hebrew year is shifting. <laughs> this yeah. is the, this is the There's crossover so point. So in a way kind of enter into a new year before most people enter into the new year. Yeah. And this is part of the reason why I do Mystic History Month during September, so that half okay. of it can be in one year, half can be in the other. <laughs> So wait, like this is so cool. Like, because I'm learning. Like, I'm listening to you, and I'm like, wow, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. Your your wisdom is crazy, <laughs> infinite. Like, like, look, I know this is your podcast, but I need to ask you a question now. <laughs> Flipping it. Um, how did you get to know about all of this? Where do, where does all this come from for you? Because it's like you know some stuff, man. 
So I've been regularly learning from the spirit for the last eight years. Yeah. Um, my journey started in 2017 with just me hearing the audible voice of God. Um, at wow. that time, I was still Christian. I was still going to a Baptist church. Um, went there for 19 years. So that was yeah. my foundation. So all my unlearning came from what I had learned in that specific church. <laughs> Yes. No slander yeah. intended, but that's where I yeah. got it from. Uh, so through a process of getting to learn the royal family, because originally, you know, you start in that background, God is just one thing. And then you learn that, that no, God is actually a family. Elohim yeah. is plural. Yeah. Um, I begin to have experiences, seeing angels, seeing demons, um, wow. having visitations from the cloud of witnesses. So I've met certain figures that other people debate about if they were ever historical or not. I'm like, I know them, therefore I know they're real. And I was meeting the father and I was meeting Holy Spirit. Um, mm -hmm. Holy Spirit, segment, same thing. Um, it wasn't until 2019 I had face-to-face -face encounter with Yeshua. He actually walked through the wall of a cruise ship that I was on. And it's really just been a progression of allowing myself. Well, one of the biggest keys is actually doing the homework that they give you. It's like, okay, we I need know. you to do this. And then you actually do it. Yeah. <laughs> Rather than just saying, yeah. Hey guys, I had a, I had a cool experience. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So where most people were willing to stop, I finished my homework and went on to the next thing and the next thing. So I've gotten mm -hmm. through what usually takes people about 40 years. Yeah. In about eight. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. as of the last maybe two years, because I've been married two years, been so over the last two years is when I fully branched out into the other areas. Because when I studied everything the first time, I studied it as a Christian, meaning I wasn't studying to understand. I was studying for apologetics. Okay. <laughs> I was studying yeah. just to disprove their thing against my thing, but I'm no right. longer in a faction. So now I just get to take the pieces that are true, that are important, and leave yeah. the other stuff behind. And that's you're such an scene. You're such an scene. As you're talking, I'm like, well, that's exactly what Yeshua did. He got, he spoke up in class and said, "No, I call bullshit." Do you know yeah. what I mean? And it's like, and I'm listening to you now. I'm like, this is the scenes. Like I can feel now. You know, like amazing. Proof that I spent a lot of time with them. <laughs> yeah, no, 100%, so you know. He and I sit in these types of conversations. So when I tell people I have a face-to-face -face relationship or I teach people to have a face-to-face -face relationship, it's very direct like this. There's yeah. there's no wonder or mystery behind, I wonder what they want me to do. It's like, no, 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 yeah. no, no. Yeah. When they're sitting yeah, yeah. in front of you and their lips are moving while they're talking to you and they'll freeze yeah. your whole world around you, like I've had Yeshua back when I was in college, I've had him show up to the school sometimes to talk to me about some things. And then after I go, people are like, hey, who was that guy with you in the robe? <laughs> Stop it. So oh it's not God. just, you know, good imagination. And then I'm channeling no, the like, energy. Oh, the actual goosebumps. entity shows up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And and like you're, you're like, you're so humble with it as well, because that's the thing. There's just like. There's more ego in the spiritual world than the ones that are sleeping, I think. Do you know what I mean? And it's just like, you know, just as soon as you, I talk to you, like, you know, because obviously this is the first time we've met. But is it, though? Is it? You know, and it's like, it's not. Um, but it's like, you know, just just humbleness. And it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's powerful, so, man. So that's, that's powerful. How, so that's how I've learned a lot of things. It's by so he's having, just fast -tracked it. Yeah. having mom or having the seven spirits explain stuff to me. <laughs> Yeah, so it's like direct telephone line. And when you think about it, hang on, talking about being the chosen one, I'm just going to pull my curtain over because I'm sat here like, ah, oh. <laughs> and the sun's right in my eyes. But I think I'm being blessed. So let me just take a moment. <laughs> there we go. So, I mean, like, this is like, yeah, I mean, so when's your when's your gospel coming out? Just saying, hey, but so this is like I, what we need. I wrote my first book. Did you? Uh, two years ago. Well, my second book two years ago. And that's the big one wow. that people usually know me for. Wow. Um, which wow. Is a guide on how to do all the stuff that I knew how to do at the time that I wrote it. 
That's maybe incredible. a month after I finished that book, I learned enough stuff to write another book. So I'm holding off because I want to do another uh, massive textbook like I did the first time. Wow. That's like, that's powerful. And it's like, you know, you, you coming into this planet at this age, at this time, do you know what I mean? And I was talking to somebody about this the other day and I was like, pay, you know, we always think that we're so insignificant or whatever. Um, we're not, because like, if you think about like the age that we've come in, it's like, you know, you're not an old man. Look, I'm 48. I'm like, listen, things are a little achy. Do you know what I mean? But I'm certainly not ready for an old people's home yet. Do you know what I mean? But it's like 48 years old. I'm in the prime of my life. You know, this is the, this is the age where we have got the strength, the wisdom, the tenacity to actually land all of these teachings and, and share with the world. Do you know what I mean? So it's like even the timing of, of what age you are now and you're receiving that and what age I am now and receiving this, you know? Um, and I think there's a massive shift as well because I always used to, I call it, I always used to call it my Jesus energy. I've always yeah. been really kind of like obsessed with time running out. I'm always just like, oh my God, you know, I'm 48 now. Well, 10 years went really quick. So not too long. I'm going to be 58 soon. And then gosh, that's nearly 60. And then before you know it, I've, I've ended my life. Do you know what I mean? And I get very panicked about time. And that time is just an illusion, right? Because everything's infinite. But I'm I do, I get panicked. <laughs> yeah, I'm, <laughs> so I'm in the right place, dude. So I'm going to, I'm coming to your classroom, hey? Because I need, I need help because I'm always like, TikTok, we got to get going. <laughs> But I know on paper that that's not the truth. I think it's just like, I believe that that is uh, failed missions. And that's the memory that's really peaking right now. You know, I call this lifetime, especially when we go back to Egypt, the continuation. Because I say to people, like, we have a significant past life that we were going, 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 going. We got taken out and we didn't expect to be taken out. It took our breath away. I know that I had four lifetimes to just chill, man, and get my get my soul parts together before I came into this life because it was so traumatizing. So I believe that there's this significant last life that we really were like so close and then it dropped. And that's where I believe the Egypt tours come in because I believe a lot of that is actually in Egypt for many of us. Yeah. And we got taken out super quick and it kind of winded us. So now we said, no, we're going to get right for 2024 because this is when it's going to be happening and beyond. And we're going to tee up like that. You know what I mean? We're going to come together and then it's go time. So I think that this timeline we're in now, there's so much memory coming into this 2024, the witch wound, you know, um, past lives of when we got taken out and it's all just very overwhelming. But I think it's what I call the balloon pop moment. It's all going to, it's all going to dissipate very, very soon, you know, very soon. I anticipate next to be completely different. And I believe the reason why Egypt's becoming more and more of a topic is because Egypt was kind of like the jack of all trades of the ancient world. That's where a little bit of everything was, where yeah. they had their massive libraries where other cultures would pour their stuff into in order to for it to be maintained. Yeah. So in a way, you might actually have a calling that, let's just say, comes from China. Yeah. That might be stored in Egypt. <laughs> yeah. Which yeah. means that everyone can benefit from Egypt because no matter where you come from or whatever you're resonating with, they have a memorial of sorts for everywhere in the ancient world. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Come on. It's, it, yeah, it's, 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 it's a library, isn't it? You know what I mean? Everything is a library. And I think that's why Avalon's coming online, aka Glastonbury, the UK. For me, that's the sacred counterpart of um of egypt but just not to get it twisted because everybody like thinks that like it's like a bit like plant medicine everybody sort of thinks it's got so popular everybody thinks the only way to ascend is actually you've got to do plant medicine no you don't have to it's like there's many ways to climb a ladder many ways and you don't have to do egypt because some people it just doesn't resonate with them so it's like you know it could be like you say peru and i don't know somewhere else you know alaska yeah. But it's just like we've all got our um, our signature frequencies planted somewhere. And for me, it's like Avalon and Egypt is my balance, you know? Yeah. yeah. Like I triggered and gained the respect simultaneously of so many people when I said the United States isn't that important when you look at the globe. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's yeah. Just, it's just a narcissism because when you're <laughs> looking at it on the spiritual grid, Texas is great. But yeah. the entire United States, no, <laughs> there's bigger <laughs> spiritual centers. Mexico yeah. and South America, for the most part, carry much more energy than the United States and Canada. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And there's some places that you can go to which have just got nothing. 
You know what I mean? Yeah. It's just, it's just like, yeah, it's just dead, you know? But, yeah. but as we were talking, like Africa as a continent, it's just, it's really, it's quite a funny old thing that Africa's always been seen as the poor relatives. And I've lived on this continent for 24 years, right? And mm -hmm. it's like, you know, like we've always been seen the ones without enough and the, the minerals are gone because the Western world comes and takes it, whatever. It's now becoming the safest, most grounded place to live. We don't, I look at the rest of the world and I'm going, well, it's not like that here. Do you know what I mean? Yes, we've got our own levels of inflation, but even that's not that bad. And it's like when people turn around and say, yeah, but you're living in Africa. And in that time we had the farm invasions and things like that. You know, the Zulus, when they go mad here, honestly, they riot. Do you know what I mean? And it's like it's like tribal warfare over again. But whatever, that's just Africa. Af that's how Africa rolls, man. So when you know there's a tsunami of bloody elephants coming through town, you just don't go out that day. Do you know what I mean? It's like so, the weather. You know, yeah, exactly. Yeah, the elephants exactly. are mad, stay in the house. Okay, no problem. <laughs> 100%. Why even bother going out? Do you know what I mean? So like you were saying, that's the hermetic principles. Know when to duck, know when to lie down, know when to be still, and know when to run. Do you know what I mean? So yeah, no, 100%, you know? So something yeah. else I wanted to mention, I'm, I, I wanted to mention this earlier and ended up forgetting, but we kind of rounded back to it, is when you were talking about fear, overcoming fear and mom helping with that. So one of the thing, one of the reasons why I've recognized and I can testify to that being legit is that mom is the only thing that's physically more powerful than Seth or Satan. Yeah. Yes. Therefore, yeah. she kind of empowers you to be more powerful than Seth, which is the only thing that could bring fear. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. actually strengthening you beyond the danger. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, Steph, that's that's powerful. Strengthening beyond the danger, because I've always said that this is my like I've gone around fear, round and round and round, because it's just yeah, so much in my life has happened around that. And I've always said to people just to keep it like basic. The only reason fear comes in is because you don't think there's a way out. If you yeah. if you go to a dinner and you're like, God, I really don't like the people that are going, and oh my God, Jilly's gonna be there, and whatever, and you don't want to go, yeah. you're gonna make an exit point going, right, we're gonna make up an excuse that, you know, the babysitter needs to leave or whatever. You create an exit point. So, which means you're more happier to go because you know that you can leave. And then the chances are Jilly's kind of okay. You end up having a great night. You end up getting home at 2 a.m. Do you know what I mean? But it's as soon as you give yourself some exits and there is ways to move around the brick wall and you know how to do that, fear becomes courage you know what i mean yeah. and it turns into something else doesn't it um but i've always said fear is untapped power and i never knew that in the beginning um i find my distortion the biggest the biggest guide you know now i welcome it i'm like oh there's the shadow look it doesn't feel very nice admittedly but it's an opportunity isn't it and i think when you start to program your brain instead of going oh my god hot potato going hang on a minute like you just said being okay and being in the chaos yeah. being okay and being in the fa fear is the biggest gold nugget I can tell anybody. That I think that's the entry point to all of it, being okay, being in it. That's the very place you want to run from. But when you're okay with being in it, it's the very place you can navigate from. So can yeah. you get to that point where you can just go, can I be in this? You know what I mean? doesn't feel Learning nice. How to out chaos the chaos. Yes. That, that's yes. what I understood from studying tu uh, Tuaret, which is to be a greater chaos than chaos. So what's Tuaret? Tell me about that. The uh, hippo goddess. She's okay. oh. so she's actually the great, the supreme mother of the wow. of ancient Egypt. I didn't even the rest know that. Are more so emanations know. of her. <laughs> yeah. So wow. she's typically depicted as a uh, humanoid hippopotamus. She has the crocodile on the back and the lioness arms. Yeah. And. It's an idea of ferocity, but even more so in that protective, loving sense. Yes. So she's labeled as a demon, but not in the way that the Western world sees demons. Yes. More so just because it's the idea of ferocity and or violence. Yeah. But it's a protective nature. So yes. in their way, you know, the Egyptians, they're looking at it. They're like, what's the best way? What can we do to personify or illustrate an overly protective mother? Yes. We're going to take a hippopotamus, a, a crocodile, and a lioness and mix them together. <laughs> <laughs> That's so in a way, Monday. that segments mom or her true <laughs> form. Yeah. So, and, yeah. And it's at wow. that state where I'm like, it's pure yin. It's yeah. uncontrollable. 
uh, uncontained love. And in some of the myths, you'll see her physically holding down Set. Like there's certain really. stories where Heru actually does kill Set, and it's Heru that uh, it's uh, Toirette that holds him down. Oh, I'm gonna <laughs> she's the only I'm gonna thing that can physically overpower yeah. Set. <laughs> well, I mean, like, you know, hippos in the actual, because I mean, I live in Africa, and there's many a time that I've actually been nearly being killed about three times by a hippo. This is truth, <laughs> because they can actually move underwater. And you're absolutely right. They are the most protective of their babies, right? And you can make the wrong kind of noise 10 Ks away, and they'll come and tell you who's boss. And yeah. they are, they're the biggest killers. Hippos yeah. and buffalo are the biggest killers. In fact, hippos are the biggest killers in Africa. And everybody says, what? No, that's not true. They think lions or whatever. Hippos are. Hippo. They will trample you. You're on their, their trail to get back in the water. You trouble, dude. Or they got babies, like you say. It's it's next level, you know? Yeah, yeah. No, it's like like, yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah. But yeah. I'm going to research that. Thank you so much. Because I didn't even, I hadn't even heard of her before. So that's yeah. amazing. She's not yeah. as popular. But she's yeah, much, this is much the thing. more powerful. <laughs> yes. So, well, this is the see. thing. She kind of fits the same description, and I might be getting in trouble with my audience, but who cares? Uh, <laughs> she fits closer to, like, if we we're talking in the Hindu sense, she fits closer to Kali. Okay. Oh, really? Um, possibly in the Greeks to Hecate. Yeah. Or Hecate. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Just that ultra powerful feminine power <laughs> that wow, you can't that even is... tell it's it's a uh, emotional or it's righteous standpoint at some point you're like is this a good thing or a bad thing what is it and yeah. it's like don't think about it like that think of it as pure power <laughs> right <laughs> at this stage right. it might not even be a conscience <laughs> yeah. it's just power it's just love yeah <laughs> and, and that that's I'm gonna I'm really gonna deep because there's a reason you're telling me this because Hecate has been coming in quite strong obviously with all the Avalonian energies and everything like that you know mm -hmm. it's like it, just going through the layers now of these deep dark mothers you know what I mean and yeah. um yeah and I just think that uh I just find the the Egyptian pantheon uh, fascinating because like you say the ones that that really really are the most interesting are the ones we don't talk about we have the obvious like Isis and everything like that but you know um Tefnut and Shu you know and it's yeah. like you know even to a point um Nut and Geb is known but they're they're like you know it's 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 like some people don't even know about Ma'at, you know, and it's yeah. like wow, it's it's it's. Uh, but I think people are fast waking up to it, which is the main thing, you know. Um, but it's another ascension ladder, isn't it? I was studying yeah. the Kemetic, the Kemetic tree of life, uh, the Egyptian yeah. one, and it was so interesting as to how that that tree of life came around because it was it was the way that Supreme God Ra was like, listen, you just can't wake up tomorrow and just be divine. Here's yeah. a bunch of gods and goddesses that you can work bit by bit to embody their aspects. There yeah. you go. And how and how much of it is still where people still wor worship the goddess? Like, for example, it's like, are you calling Sekhmet in or are you calling her up? I always say that, call her forth, you know, like, because she is you, right? And I think that, like, for a long time, I know I did in my practice, I was... Um, I was like taking a long time to kind of like grasp that concept that those are actually aspects of us. They are not to be worshipped separate because then we stay in separation with them. We are yeah. not worthy, you know? So it's one a, the, yeah. One of the cool things about uh, Toirette, just to give her a little bit more publicity. Yeah, uh, this is great. She's often this is considered great. the wife of Apep or Apophis. Yes. Yes, but not from a they get along standpoint. It's kind of she's the only energy that can actually overpower him too. <laughs> oh, really? So I know she's kind of like that, that which keeps him in control <laughs> on a cosmic level. Um, ladies, how many? How many of us? <laughs> so, are it's, so it's like, oh, sets no problem if a pep is her usual boxing partner. Like if, yeah. if you're used to sparring Mike Tyson, you don't worry about Floyd Mayweather. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. Just bringing it to real terms, man. No, that is that is so funny. But it's so true. It's so true, you know? So, yeah. I'm going to deep dive on that. I'm going to be, like, emailing you and just going, dude, I'm just like, you know, I am into this. Yeah, that's very, very powerful. Very powerful. So we're getting ready to wrap up. I wanted to open the floor for you to kind of just share any last bits of wisdom that you might want to share with the audience. I think the biggest thing over and all, 
everything that I've shared is like, I always call it the gospel of Marie and I kind of drive people mad with it because I think the biggest message I can give to you, meaning the audience is trust in your own intuition. This week has been such a reminder of that. It's like really, really coming up front and center that we have to really, really go into our own gifts and skill sets and start listening to our own inner voice. Doesn't matter. Like, you know, somebody like even us talking here, right. is an opinion, right. Mm -hmm. It's an opinion. It's, it's Nelson's talking about his vibe. Marie's talking about hers, but it's what our truth that we've discovered thus far. Right. So it's mm -hmm. an, an invitation to bring you to the circle, to the space and bring your truth in. You know what I mean? It's like, Oh, I know something about that. And as soon as you start talking, wisdom comes behind it. So I really think that it's about the gospel of you the way that you apply that in a day-to-day -day manner is journal, make sure you journal, okay? Even if it's just one paragraph after your meditation, something came through, fought for the day, write, because then your pen will go even further and then you've crossed over from your head and you've gone into your heart, you've accessed your wisdom, your higher self is talking and it'll be your pen and paper that takes you there first. And then when you read those words back, you'll go, I didn't write that. And then that's the magical moment. That happened for me. I was like, who wrote that? And it wasn't even in the speak that I had. That was the first moment I realized that I was a channel. And then I and then I opened up to that. And then I started to stop having all of these other readings of people and everything like that because I didn't need to because I'm my own counsel, you know? So so that's my biggest message for everybody actually to just, you know, really step into the gospel of you because that is time now, you know? So that's that's my gospel for your gospel. <laughs> That's awesome. So um, where can people connect with you? Where can they find you? I would say my best, my my home is like your home, Nelson. I am like a lover of YouTube. My my own name, Marie Coveley, is, is where you'll find me. If you just pop that in, you'll see everything Egypt. And on my YouTube, um, I obviously do a, any portal days, I'll do a live, which is a ceremony online. I'll also do a free online masterclass. This one that's coming up is on the 26th of September and it's Ma'at, Sekhmet and Hathor and that's a Zoom room and if you go on to the latest videos you'll see the link there so just come and join us um, and then and then and then of course the Tablets of Light tour which is basically next year anybody that wants to come to Egypt for a star seed I won't bore you the details because if you go onto the YouTube page you'll just see a multitude of that but um, yeah I would say that YouTube is probably my the best place for me to find me you know so uh, pop along there and then you'll uh, dip your toes in and come and join the community you know so yeah well marie it's been great having you on <laughs> well thank you so much for inviting me i tell you god this is like a reunion of night no i'm like super happy thank you awesome well that concludes this episode of the inner until next time y'all be blessed later